Sorry. OK. So the plan for today is to start and finish, hopefully, uh, to speak about uh, usability testing. That is one of the kind of user evaluation that we covered, partly we covered in the course, and partially we are going to cover uh, in January. And uh, in addition to this, today I also have some updates for you that uh, uh, are related to uh, not milestone number three, sorry, uh, but to um, what happens next week. And milestone number four, and a question that I received in the lab, and I would like to give a clear and answer to everybody. But this in, in the end, and probably also a, a, a news about tomorrow. But it depends how many time I spent on this slide. And so we are still speaking about evaluation. So in your project, in, your, in this course, we started the process from need finding, prototyping, uh, some heuristics, and you used the heuristic for some sort of evaluation. You evaluated your paper prototype with heuristics, and, and so you, give, you have this brief two slides about evaluation uh, some weeks ago. The first is this one, the, the second slide you already seen is the next one. So just to recap, the goal of an evaluation in general is to evaluate a system, an application, an interface according to different criteria the usability, the functionality, the acceptability, and so on. And this evaluation may happen, as you experimented, in different stages. When you have a sketch, when you have a prototype, when you have an advanced prototype, or on the final product, and or on the final product. And it, which kind of evaluation, it depends also on the initial goal of your system, or your work. It may happen along different dimension. Could be related to the to usability. Could be in general. Could be an experiment to understand whether a function is more used in a certain way or in another, or, or something like that. And obviously, you can use a range of very different technique. But. As you, you, you imagine, this evaluation test, the usability, functionality, and acceptability on an interactive system is also very wide and a little bit general, vague definition. It's not yet precise. But the idea, as is written here, is to identify and correct problem as soon as possible. And this as soon as possible is about all these design stage, goals, dimension, and techniques. So you can detect problems also in the final version of your project before releasing to the public, for instance. So it's as soon as possible in any case. And you already have seen, just in a slide like this, uh, and Professor Corno give you uh, some information about all of these in these slides a week, some, some weeks ago, that evaluation may have different approaches and may happen in different places. So typically, evaluation happens in two places, in the lab or in the field. And in the lab is also a way to say in a room that is controlled, so you can have people uh, speak with them in a quiet setting, while in the field they require that you go uh, and see people in their daily life. And uh, you can have three kinds of evaluation uh, approaches. The first one is involving user. The second one is based on expert evaluation. And the third one is automated. And all these three methods, uh, approaches, could be obviously uh, merged together according to specific needs. Either you can maybe involve user and have an expert evaluation, or you can have an automated evaluation some part <coughs> 
of your system or your prototype and involve the user for another part on different stages require different approaches, use different approaches more than require. And, and again, inside all this uh, portion of these approaches, you can mix maybe some experimental methods with some query methods. Again, to have a full, a more comprehensive evaluation. And uh, you already have had a brief overview of expert evaluation. You did an expert evaluation. You did an heuristic evaluation that it's here among expert evaluation. So it's an evaluation that is made by expert in a sense, because the heuristic, you have to know what are the heuristics, what mean uh, understand the visibility of the system or the system should be visible in any stage. So it needs not just one person anywhere. If you give the 10 heuristic Nielsen on a piece of paper and say evaluate this to just one person that is uh, going through this corridor, probably you cannot receive a real, uh, a well done heuristic evaluation because it, it needs some additional information. Mm? Or you can have model-based methods or review methods. So you start from the literature, from what happens from the guidelines, and you apply them and verify your work with respect of this. Or you can also have uh, automated uh, evaluation. So you have a, a software that verifies some properties. Hmm? For instance, if the button is reachable, there is a branch of software engineering that is about GUI testing that verify that GUI doesn't break, that things, the test works, and so on. And these automated are especially for low-level issues. This button is clickable, this button is still visible on a mobile, while on the desktop is not visible, and so on. But here we are today, uh, we, are, we are mainly focusing on the involving user part. And you already see of these three steps, query methods, some query methods, and some observational methods. Do you remind some of that as an example? You did it, both. At least one method of observation and one method of query. What you did, uh, except the heuristic evaluation with the user, with end user, with your target user, what you did. You did interviews. Interviews are query methods. You query people for information. Interviews, survey, questionnaire are query methods. And observation, <laughs> you perform as observation. Mm? And you've seen with Professor Corno also diary studies. Mm? These are observation because you observe people directly or not directly people doing thing. And this, you use that for need finding because you don't have a prototype, but you can use also this for evaluating, for getting feedback on your interactive system or your prototype. You can ask people, what do you think about it? What's the process? You can observe people using your application and catch any error. Maybe you think that for going from screen, screen A to screen B, you just have to click a couple of times, but people, if you observe people using your interface, you discover that they click 1,000 times because they follow a very long path to change these pages. You just didn't think of, of this. And so observing people also with an existing prototype is a good, a good thing, a thing that it's, it's possible to do. So. While query methods and observational methods mainly apply what you already know, what you already did um, uh, as, as behavior, you can interview people, obviously. Uh, experimental methods is something new. That is something that we are going to start today and we are going to continue uh, in January. So today we are focusing, and then I will go back to the other slide, on uh, usability or user testing, the more, let's say, correct way is probably to call it usability testing, but is often called also user testing, versus controlled experiment or user study. 
So let's stick for with the usability testing versus controlled experiments, just not to uh, make any confusion. So these are two main family type of experimental methods in human computer interaction. Uh, the one that we are going to see today and that we are going to ask you for milestone number four is usability testing. So the idea behind usability testing is let's find some people, let's have them use our application, our system, our whatever it is, so that we hopefully get some feedback on how to improve it. So this is the spirit, let's say, of usability testing. So it's mostly anecdotal and surely observation driven. You observe people, you ask people to do something, you query people with some interview, with some questionnaire, if needed, you can uh, in usability testing. And this is, again, something that we are going to do today or this week in general. And this is something that we are going to ask you, let me say this again, for milestone number four, hmm? to perform a usability testing of your application. And also notice that for usability testing, the idea is let's find someone to use our app. So it's really focused on a system, an application, a function. Control experiment instead are scientific. So when we start speaking about control experiment, we can start speaking about science, not about uh, design or engineering, but about science. Because controlled experiments are hypothesis driven. You formalize an hypothesis of something that must work or should work in a way and you verify that hypothesis. And the idea in control experiment is we want to verify if user, our user, our target user, obviously, of your app perform a given task or a given set of tasks faster, with fewer error, whatever you want here, than our competitor's app or than another version of the app. So you, you see here the first difference between usability and control experiment. Usability is let's get some people try our app our app, our single app, and get some feedback. And the other is, we have an hypothesis that doing things in this way is better in some way that we, you have to decide which is some, this way. And let's compare this with another thing that do the same, uh, the same task. So we want to uh, verify if the user uh, book uh, the train I'm sorry, uh, faster with your app than with Trenitalia. Hmm? It's, it's controlled. Or we want to verify whether the button sign up in a given website is better, is more used, is more comprehensible, is whatever you want to measure than the same website with another button. Instead of sign up, learn more for instance. I'm just saying things randomly, but the idea is you can have two apps different to compare. You have to have two versions of the same app, of same website, system, whatever you want, and compare it in a scientific and hypothesis-driven way. And this is something that we are going to do in January. And we are not asking you to perform on your app. Also because you need something to compare. So for someone, it's possible. Again, the example of your colleagues Trinitalia. For other groups, maybe it's a little bit more difficult. But we are not going to ask you this for your project. And this is something that we are going to do in January. Uh, let me do a step back. Uh, among uh, having an experiment on the lab or having an experiment, an evaluation in the field. Uh, so evaluation in the lab has some advantages and some disadvantages as well as in the field. So evolution in the lab has for sure an advantage that you have specialistic, dedicated equipment available if you want. Do you want to video record what happens? You can, because you are in an environment that you set up. And hopefully you also have an uninterrupted environment. 
So you can start your evaluation and continue up to the end without anybody that asks for anything, without any message that anybody receives, because that is the task that people are going to do, the evaluation. As the disadvantage is, you have a lack of context. If you want to, I'm sorry again, uh, I, I take it the project of your, uh, your colleague here as an example. If you want to understand whether people are catching or not trains, you cannot test it in a lab because you don't have trained it or late, basically. So you, you lack of context in some cases. If you want to experiment a gym uh, exercise, physical exercise in home, you cannot have people doing exercise in a lab. It's a little bit weird. But so your you lack of context, and this is a, this a, in a, this a, a cons of this, this approach. And in a lab, it's also difficult to serve several users cooperating. So if you have an application or system in which you have 10 people that have to work together spontaneously, or like in, for a class, you, you put 10 people in a, in a room and say, work together, and it's not really the same thing that having that spontaneously work together. Uh, so it's for sure appropriate for single user system if you want to control something or test the usability of something and if the system location is dangerous or impractical. So, and or if you accept a lack of context and uh, for instance a lack of context. Evaluation in the field, conversely, has obviously some advantages like the natural environment. You are in a train station, you are at home with users. You have the context that is retained because it's there. They are working their natural, typical environment. Even if in some cases the observation, you observing, you performing thing may alter the context because you are there. Typically, instead, in that activity, you are not. And also, in the field, there is possible longitudinal studies. So studies that span a short, long period of time in which you have multiple repeated measures for people. So let's say that you want to uh, check whether uh, with your app for the train, you, are not, you catch the right train in one month. Of daily working. So this is in the field. So you can perform these studies in which you have a repeated measure every time you have a train that is late, that is quite often here, uh, you get, check what happens. It uses the app, the app works, you check something. Or every time you hit what is hitting, what the person is eating. So you have a short, long time study in the field with a repeated measure that can be also uh, analyzed from a statistical point of view. So in a sense, could be a, a cousin of uh, a brother of a, experiment, um, a controlled experiment. As a disadvantage is, you have distractions. You have noise. If you are doing a, a physical exercise at home and the phone rings, you, you have to stop that activity, maybe because you have to answer the phone. So there are distractions that may uh, change things in the evaluation. Uh, obviously, this is appropriate where context is, is crucial and also for longitudinal studies as well as, as when you have several people cooperating. Because in a natural environment, it's probably easier to see how these people cooperate. So if you are, for instance, interested in uh, understanding how people use the smartphone, how much they use the smartphone, how many notifications they receive, you cannot have an evaluation in the lab. Because how can you understand how many notifications you receive in a month? You place a people in a lab and close the door for a month. So it's easier to do it in the field, in the wild, while this people is living his life and collect the data uh, from, from these people. And also, uh, evaluation in the field allow you to have more people involved. Mm. Uh, evaluation in the lab, we are going to see is typically from five to 30 people. It depends 
of the different kind of experiments uh, evolution in the field you can also have 1000 people for three years for 30 years whatever if you are able to reach all these people obviously but uh, why not so yeah, i don't know if you uh, a couple of years ago facebook uh, used to present pieces of the interface uh, different on different users so some user have the navigation bar on the top and some other user have the navigation bar on the bottom for instance so you don't have to install a different version just the same version they decide some user group a as the navigation bar on the top and group b as navigation bar on the bottom and they perform an evolution in the field of which and the controlled experiment of which of these uh, navigation bar is better on the top on the, on the bottom with uh, with text with just icon and this was let's say a controlled experiment in the field with a lot of people all the facebook user with a mobile app in the world mm -hmm. so this is the main difference uh, obviously for usability testing we are going to speak about in the lab mm -hmm. uh, today and in general mm -hmm. So, back to usability testing. Usability testing, uh, in general, speeds up many projects and produces cost saving also in system development. And obviously, participants, but you already know this, should represent the intended user communities, the target user that you have. And when you conduct usability tests, and think about user, you should have particular attention to the background in computing and experience with the task. Maybe you want people more experienced with the task, less, less experienced with the task. If you have a computer system and you have an expert in using a computer, maybe you introduce bias in your, in your use because you want to understand how a novice developer uses Eclipse, for instance. No, you want to understand the usability of Eclipse. And so you take a computer professional uh, that already uses Eclipse. It's, not some, it, it's a kind of evaluation if you take a person that is just completed the computer science course at the first year, probably you have a different perspective about the usability of the same software application. So this may change and it's something to consider. And also, you can uh, consider the motivation for doing the test in the lab or in the wild, the education. You are interested in people with high literature, high school, university degree, PhD professors, president of the world, I don't know, or uh, children, elementary school, whatever. And uh, obviously, if you use, have an application with difficult or specific word, also, the ability to understand this word. Again, if you are doing an application for developer, you're using some uh, word that probably you don't use in a cooking application because there are domains really different. And all this usability testing was a movement that started quite a long ago. And this movement was embraced also by industries and stimulated building of ad hoc usability lab that we don't have and it's not they are not really needed uh, in general but usability testing labs are well keep the room uh, that typically consists of two areas uh, one is the testing room where you perform any kind of usability testing in the picture is the lady with the green uh, uh, garment over there and the observation room like in a police movie you have someone behind the, the, the glass that see what happens in the other room and you see here this person that is seeing the people that is seeing what happens in the other room it has a camera and see some data and it has a microphone to speak with the person in the other room and the person uh, over there is alone without anybody that is serving and interfering with anything and these so two rooms connected in this way with this equipment and the testing room is typically smaller than uh, the observation room because you just have one tester and something like that not a lot of people um, 
and and obviously the observation room instead is bigger than the testing room because you can also bring other people in and have some interviews some other um, feedback get other feedback from people so it has to accommodate more people if needed so you don't while these are formal ad hoc fixed usability testing lab with every material that you may imagine and also probably something that you cannot uh, these are not really needed for usability testing because it really depends for, for which kind of uh, things you need to perform usability testing and so you when you are going to do some usability testing you will not have this also because we we don't here uh, but you can obviously replicate some ideas uh, of this also in the settings that you are going to to use so usability testing essentially and this is about the process is performing in three steps in which the first one is the more complex the second one should be done very well and the third one sh should be done in an adequate way let's say but it's if you fail the first one it's it's a huge problem because you have to, to redo anything if the first one is done very well the second one is done appropriately the third one is easier to do so the three steps are plan the test run obviously the test and then analyze the result so plan there are quite a lot of things to planning for um, usability testing so let's try to, to go the, through this list so first of all as you expected you have to choose who you will involve in the test who are your target user they are computer engineering students they are university students they are worker uh, that takes trains they whatever hmm? that is for you is your target population hmm? basically then you have obviously to decide how many of them to uh, include in, a, in your usability test and uh, Nielsen uh, in this article here say that the number is five so with five participants in a usability testing you get the main problem like 80 percent of the problems while if you add some other people you just move a little bit 85 86 just you don't have a big advantage on in doing usability tests with more than five people so five people is a good number uh, in this in this article uh, they also explain that for card sorting test uh, that is another kind of test you just need at least 12 people it's a different number but for usability test you typically can stay around five people mm -hmm. uh, without so five six it's it's fine but with six people or five people it's demonstrated that you don't have a big difference in the results and then the third things for for the first preparation uh, about people so who are your user your target user how many of them you need and which roles you have to play so in, in a similar way to the heuristic evaluation also here you have two roles two roles uh, the first one is the facilitator of the session the one that speak with the, the person who is testing the application or the system that does let's say the front-end work and then you have other typically one two three not more than three people that serve as either note taker or observer so people that observe what happens because the facilitator is the goal of facilitator is facilitating the session explaining how to do things not to observe how the user behave the other people takes note of what happens and observe what happens and the facilitator uh, must not be because there is a huge bias uh, developers of the system designer of the system creator of the system whatever you want of the system because 
uh, when the facilitator is the person who created in some way the system is more uh, propense to say ah no you have to do this or ah, no, you are not clicking there because it's an expert of the interface he know how it work so if the facilitator is a person that know nothing or a little bit more than nothing of the um, of the application of the system is more impartial cannot suggest things because he doesn't know what to suggest while the developers know how it works how you go from a point a to a point b so can suggest implicitly or explicitly especially if the tester is the, the participant is stuck in some activity he doesn't know how to proceed or where to click or something like that so this is very important in general then you decide which are your user which role you are playing and how many of them and and which which profile you are going to to get then you have to choose which task you are going to ask your participant to perform so instead in the heuristic evaluation you should have uh, add the, the interface and basically people using randomly the interface without not too much guidance here instead the goal is to give a concrete and clear task clear goal so for instance uh, you realize an application for booking a room like a meeting room and the task could be book a room for 20 person 20 persons uh, from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Clear and precise task. You, you give the number of people you are expected to have in that room and the time range <coughs> that is the room. So if your system is just about this, these are all the information. And if your system do a lot of other things, this is one of the tasks about one of the function of your system. So concrete and clear with all the needed information not just book a room or, or maybe you may also have a, a, a task that is book a room and then you cannot verify whether the uh, way in which you ask for the room size and the time for which booking this room is is reasonable or not because it's people is cho choosing freely so you have to control a little bit what you are, uh, are going to ask and so have a concrete and clear task and tasks sometimes if you want maybe introduce with a scenario in which you say ah, okay the user is interesting is a worker is interesting in meeting a room in booking a room for his meeting with 20 person in the afternoon so the task is now use the interface to book a room and so on and typically a usability test includes overall five to ten tasks Hmm? then if it's if it is four or eleven is not a big difference but the, the range is more or less that hmm? because the usability test is not something that have to, to last three three years something shorter in time hmm? you have a person in your inter in front of your interface that is doing a series of tasks then you maybe have to ask some something to this person and then you have another person already doing the same thing so you cannot you have five people doing again and again the same thing so it, it cannot be something endless five to ten tasks then you can also choose uh, you have to define the criteria for which your task is successful or not so again booking a, a room if you insert the wrong if you book a room for 10 people when you are going to ask 20 probably is pa a partial or a complete failure of the task if you ask for booking 20 people for 20 people in 4 p.m 6 p.m and the user books for a room for 100 people from 3 p.m to 9 p.m obviously the, the slot is there but it's not the task that you are going to that you ask so that is partially or completely failed it depends from the specific application so the criteria 
define the criteria for failure and success when the task is successful and then uh, choose any methodology and we are going to see two of them in, in a few minutes uh, that you are willing to apply for each task or for some task so for instance you can use think aloud for a task or cooperative evaluation or just none just having people doing the task without any added methodology while doing the task and this methodology again could be for all the tasks could be for some particular task could be for none ta none of the task it's just a design choice in a sense there is no right or, or wrong answer it depends of the information that you want to extract and analyze from your uh, usability test and from the task in particular so it's something that is really related to the kind of task that you are going to, uh, to present to use okay. then you can also have to decide whether you need or want yeah Okay, so obviously if you have just an app for booking a room, it's difficult to create five tasks. I agree. If the app is for managing rooms in a building like Politecnico, for instance. So you can maybe have a task for booking a meeting room with a time, without a time. A task for booking a classroom over an entire semester just booking a room but it's different uh, functionality obviously uh, just uh, an application for doing one task it's quite limited but also in that case if you have an application just for booking rooms you can generate five tasks with, by acting obviously you don't have to have just the number of people and the time but you can also have i don't know like booking this room for the entire semester that is different for booking this room one time for uh, 4 to 5 p.m. Okay? Yeah. If the system has uh, many functionalities, is it better to have uh, uh, completely independent tasks to ask or a sort of cumulative way? For example, uh, book a room for tomorrow. The next is uh, book a room for tomorrow for 20 persons. The other task is So, uh, let's say that it, it depends. Uh, for sure, you, you can have, so in the three examples that you made, you can have the first and the third one. Because the second one is just a special case of the third one, basically. Uh, for the first one, book a room, and the third one, that is book a room uh, from date, from time to time, with this amount of people, uh, it depends because maybe you also have other function you want to, to see if people insert i don't know the time of starting or the number of people even if some of this information is not mandatory let's say maybe the default is it's okay maybe they change the default information maybe obviously the time of starting the time of ending is a mandatory information for booking a room but maybe the number of people is not i, I don't care just a room the first one is available hmm? because it's the task is generic so while the second one is is redundant redundant the first and the third could be both saved but it depends what which kind of uh, things you want to, to test hmm? so if you have just a bigger application with a lot of functionality uh, just having two tasks that insist on the same functionality probably is not optimum because you just use two tasks for for the same thing We, we will make an example of uh, this is a preview we will make an example tomorrow probably of how to create a plan for usability testing together so probably you can also better understand uh, all of these things about task mainly so uh, you have decided people you have decided task you have decided any additional methodology you have still to decide uh, two things the first one that is not the first one in uh, 
uh, in the slide, it's select which equipment you need. So you need to, uh, I don't know, according to your, the criteria, the methodology, you need to video record the session, you need to add uh, a log on your software application for getting time in where each the person click on a button to see how fast the operation are made or, or not. Hmm? It depends on the criteria and the methodology. And then you have to decide whether you need or want additional information, like background questionnaire, demographic information, typically before the entire session, or after the entire session of test, you may ask additional information. How do you think that uh, is the application is to use? Is the application nice? It's just general question uh, about the entire test or you may have a question before and or after each task or each meaningful group of tasks hmm? if the application is for, for instance split in separate parts hmm? and so this is another thing that you have to decide and then almost finally you have to prepare an informed consent form to participant to fill hmm? you cannot video record register people without their consent absolutely <laughs> then the last thing that you have to decide is whether to have a debriefing session at the end of the text the test mm -hmm. so you perform you greet the, the participant give her your 10 task uh, you made for instance a, a questionnaire at the end of the session and you can have a debriefing session mm -hmm. a, a moment in which observer and note taker can ask freely personalized question to the participant. So why do you did this? I noticed that you didn't click here or you, you made these strange comments in that moment. So the observer cannot speak during the test, I'm just observer. So why? Or there is something else that you want to, to, to give, to, to say to us. So, general question, a conversation, brief conversation to, to sum up and uh, get some additional feedback or answer to specific question. And this could be done or not, it, it depends. Could be planned and then skipped for some participant because they perform task very well and you have nothing to ask or, or, or not. Uh, after all this decision, you have to develop a written test protocol that is called script that contains a step-by-step -step instruction with all the needed question and form and it's often down to the exact words that the facilitator will say so the facilitator take the script and say welcome my name is and you are going to test this application this same exact sentence for every participant in the same exact way just to give everybody the same information to be sure to give everybody the same information hmm? to avoid to think uh, to say oh i i didn't uh, give this information to participant number two but to give this to participant number three hmm? just to have consistency strong consistency among all the session and the appendix of this script may contain also a table with all the tasks in a column and another column, all the matrix of the task. And once you did this, you make this decision, you uh, develop the written test protocol, you can practice before doing the actual evaluation, the script with friends of a colleague, just to understand that everything is fine, that everything works, that any data collection methods that you implemented worked, that the video recording is accurate enough that the audio recording if you decide is you can you can listen to it and to, if your application crashes for one reason or the other this is a good moment to to discover before starting the, the usability test because when you start usability test pro typically you get a room and fix time with people and i don't know the the test lasts half an hour so you get participant number one at nine and participant number two and ten if the application crashes and you cannot recover it you just don't have time to you have to reschedule everything so it's something that you 
you should, should not have problem with your application or with the equipment in that moment. You should come prepared before starting the usability test. So the informed consent form that I mentioned before is uh, typically a piece of paper that uh, part each participant have to read, understand and sign. And this piece of paper say that a free volunteer to participate in this experiment, in this test, that he is informed uh, what uh, he have to do, try an application about this and that, and which pre procedure will be followed. Uh, if he has any question before or after a test, he has obviously the, the right to, to ask them. And uh, uh, he can decide in any moment to leave the test without any explanation. Uh, and he sign that just to say that is an affirmation. And typically it also includes something about privacy. So you don't release publicly, publicly the video recording, if any, with the face of the people on the web or something like that. Mm? You, you ask them some people to recognize, ask, ask them something, to recognize some things that happens and also promise them that you whatever that happens remains the room and you don't say anything about the test you don't publish the video of uh, with his or her mistakes on the web uh, or something like that hmm. uh, metrics so we are going to ask speak here about metrics and methodologies metrics metrics as I told you before are needed for uh, deciding success success and failure criteria and for getting additional information and you have two kinds of metrics the subjective metrics and quantitative metrics quantitative metrics is everything that you can measure in your test successful completion rate how many tasks has been completed correctly 90 percent 80 percent five out, out of ten and so on error rates which is the error rates of your task in general, a single task maybe has a huge error rate uh, because people made a lot of errors and just one task, all the tasks some kind of errors. The time of task, how, how long a single user stay on a task. If you're expecting that all task last one minute and task number three lasts 15 minutes, probably there is a problem in that specific task. And subjective met meet metrics like background information, things that you have to ask. You are going to ask if it's a male or female, you are going to ask the age or not. These are all the information that you all information that you can use then in your analysis. Maybe you discover that your application is easier to use in some sense with 15 years old people and not with 50 years old people. Uh, if you have, uh, after each task is completed, you may ask for ease and satisfaction about the task or the overall ease of use, the overall satisfaction, the overall likelihood to use or recommend the entire application to other at the end. So different kind of question, subjective metrics and quantitative metrics instead are number that you can objectively get from the, the application, the system in general in use. And these are just a list of possible metrics. So you have, for instance, a successful task completion, uh, the, where the description is a task is successfully complete when the participant indicate they have found the answer or completed the task goal. He books the room from uh, 20 people from four to five. And this could be a Boolean value, it's true or false, or more often it's just a scale. Because it's just a scale, because you can also have non-critical error. Hmm? Error that are recovered by the participant and do not result in the participant ability to complete the task with success. Hmm? So booking the room, booking the room for 50 people instead of 20, is a not critical error because you ask for 20 and the room is for 50 or for 10, the same, is a not critical error. So not critical error could be a number, a relative error, or they may affect the value, the scale of the successful, the task completion. So booking a room for 20 people from 4 to 5 p.m. is 100. Booking a room for 
20 people from 5 to 6 is 5 to 6 is 10 points, so it's 90. And this is something that you have to decide how much the error is uh, it weight. Mm? Then you have also critical error. Mm? That errors that cannot allow you to complete the task, the participant to complete the task. Mm? Uh, in this error, time could be important. Maybe you have an application for which a task, again, the, the idea of train, you have a late, you have uh, one minute to catch a new train. If the task for booking the train is longer than one minute, you, you, it's, it's useless because the train leave. So it, no matter if you book the train five minutes later, because the train departed four minutes before the time. So this is, it's a not a critical error, probably, if you want, because the, the operation is completed, but it's extremely important error, because the task is successful, uh, but, 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 but it's failed, in, in a sense, in, for the context. So you can consider this as a no critical error by using, for instance, five, 50 points out of, cha of uh, 100, or you can say this task, the metric of this task, is that the task must be completed in one minute. So if you don't complete the task in one minute, I stop it and give you another task. And the task is failed. Because you may be, you are able to, to complete the task in a longer time, but you don't have that longer time. Mm? Because the train leaves, for instance. Mm? Or the people die, mm? in another case, if you are in an hospital, for instance. Um, then you can calculate the error-free rate, that is the percentage of participants who complete the task without any error. And it's typically a relative number, a percentage. Uh, you can have the time on task, the amount of time it takes to participant to complete your task. And this is, for instance, something that you, according to some methodology, you may or may not uh, calculate. And I will see why. Um, and then you have subjective measure and like, dislike, recommendation. So question, do you, do you think that the system is useful from one that is not at all to five that is extremely useful? And you just have a Likert scale from one to five, from one to seven, from one to nine, whatever you prefer. And also you can ask participant by writing or speaking what you like about the system what you don't like about the system, the application, if you have something that you want to improve it, and this could be in the questionnaire, could be in the briefing session as well. For these last two things, there are questions, you can create your questionnaire with your question, obviously, but there are reliable and validated questionnaire that, that, uh, that exist for these two um, type kind of uh, metrics. So you can use, create a questionnaire from scratch or use one of these questionnaire that, again, we are going to, to see them, two of them, three in reality. So these are just a kind, some metrics, you just, then you have to, to decide which apply for which task and which value give to each metric. And instead, for methodology, the main methodology that you use, so the first methodology that you use for uh, usability tests is no methodology. You just have the task and people perform the task and after a given time or after the task completion, you have a new task. One methodology that you can apply to a given task is the think aloud. The think aloud is a way to vocalize your thought, the participant thought. So while the participant perform a task, the facilitator asks her to describe what is doing, why is doing, what is thinking, what is expecting that it will happen. So to just describe what is going or she is going to do. So this has obviously some advantages because it's simple, it requires like little expertise, can provide useful insights. You may be expected the user click on a button and you say, okay, now I'm going to click to this button because this. And you say, okay, this is something that we don't, didn't consider. So you can have some additional information. 
and also can show how the system is actually used hmm? maybe a specific task could have uh, think out as disadvantages that this is highly subjective more than other because it's just the person how it thinks in that specific moment uh, is selective and the act of describing things may alter task performance may alter the successful rate because his thinking is distracting is speaking with you is asking questions so may distract people and obviously the time on task cannot be uh, the time on task metric cannot be used for a task with think aloud because obviously time on a think aloud task are bigger than time without think aloud because you have to the, the participant have to speak have to explain have to answer questions so you you force time to be longer than that Another methodology is the cooperative evaluation that is a variation of think aloud in which the difference is that the facilitators and the think aloud is the person that uh, vocalize his thought. Uh, here, the participant and the facilitator collaborate during the evaluation. So the, the participant has question, the facilitator has question, and so it's much more, uh, it, it increases the disadvantages of think aloud and have some additional advantages because it's easier to use because the facilitator can guide better the participant and can encourage to criticize the system, the application, the interface and you can also ask clarification so you think this, why you think this? while in the think aloud it's just the person that wants to receive the instruction how to perform the think aloud have to do the task and just speak without the facilitator asking other questions. Hmm? Then equipment. Equipment, you can have a um, usability lab, uh, like we did before, but you can decide which equipment and this everything of this work well. You can have a laboratory with two or three rooms with audiovisual equipment. You can have just a room with portable recording. You just want to record audio. You just want to record uh, video from the camera. You can have an eye tracker that uh, get where the user is looking in the screen. You can have just no recording equipment. You just have observer that have to be very, very precise. Uh, you can have this remotely via Skype, via whatever you want, uh, moderated or not. You can mix things. You can have some recording for audio and video. And you can also have an observer for complement audio and video because once you register five hours of video, then you have also to watch five hours of video, get notes from that. So probably it's a good idea to have a server and record something just in case the observer is not taking, uh, is missing something just to avoid to watch again five hours of videos um, from one person so you can mix this and materials again paper and pencil for taking notes audio that is good for think aloud because people are speaking video is for for sure more accurate typically is not done with the, the webcam or the computer, but with a real camera, so maybe also a little bit obtrusive. You can also have the computer is logging things. So when you click a certain button, it save a timestamp, and so you can also calculate time from the start of a task and the end of a task automatically without saying, okay, it's past its minutes. You can retrieve that. You can stop the task automatically after a minute if you set a timer for a given task. You have to instrument your application if you want to use this to for for the test it's not just the it may also be not the the normal application but an application that is instrumented with timers with blockers with things that uh, move from one task to another and give some guidance a little bit of guide not guidance uh, record things for what concerns the specific task uh, Computer logging has the drawback that you may also have a large amount of data difficult to analyze because you may log one timestamp per second and you have again 30 minutes of test so you have a, a lot of timestamp you have to, to to understand which event is linked to which timestamp and so on. 
in practice as i told you before there is a mixed use you have people that take notes you have some automatic support tool for computer logging or uh, video recording or extracting task from text from audio uh, you may have a tracker or not you just mix this thing together to get the best uh, chance of analyze data as possible um, okay so I, I have to give you a couple of news so um, just to okay let me just do this and then um, the news and then we will we'll continue tomorrow so in the plan you just in the end you have this questionnaire that you can realize or not and uh, uh, this is a questionnaire for each task that can be provided after each task this is a standard questionnaire, so it's reliable, it's valid. It's just one question, and its name is a single is question. Uh, that is, uh, it's just one question because post-task questionnaire needs to be short. While end the questionnaire at the end of the task could be, the end of the session could be also 20 questions. You, you have time because it's the end. Between tasks, should be shorter as possible so typically it's just one two or three questions not, not more because you don't want to interfere with the process with the flow so people is using an, an interface then fill a, a questionnaire that is back to the computer then another questionnaire so you don't want to, to have all these interruptions so they should be rarely used i would say and when it, it they were used uh, they should be short so just one two or three question and this is just one question uh, and this the result of this is reliable valid and sensitive and this simple question that is overall this task was one very difficult up to seven very easy hmm? so just about the easiness of this specific task so rate the difficulty of the task, the activity they just completed, just from very easy to very difficult. So one is very easy, seven, no. One is very difficult, seven is very easy, and if you select five, it's probably um, quite easy, hmm? not a lot. So just one question to get the easiness, the ease of use of that specific task, if you are interested on this, uh, in this kind of information instead of creating something like this you can use it that is valid with the seven point likert scale uh, tomorrow we are going to see two post test questionnaire one is the system usability scale that is widely used it's quite old 1986 1986 and it's quite used also in industry also in other um, field it, it, outside computer engineering and computer science and also a nasa questionnaire test that they created for aerospace application so this is something that we are going to continue tomorrow tomorrow after this they are not a lot just just five slides i think yeah more or less um, what we are going to do is stop the video recording so tomorrow lecture will not be video recorded except the first 30 minutes or something like that and we are going to create hopefully a script or a sample of a draft of a script for a usability test and so we are going through the plan phases that is something that you are going you, you will need to do for milestone 4 together for an application for a desktop application that um, that we will see tomorrow but it's an application that you know uh, in the end and so we design some task and we um, design some task for some function that may be particularly difficult maybe for this application that do a, do a lot of things obviously so this is tomorrow uh, i will write also this on, on slack for your colleagues that are not here uh, updates and i will also publish this on slack tomorrow but this is a preview for for you that are here at this time so uh, let's start with this question that i received i already responded to this 
various time but that's so this is also video recorded so it, it's it, it remains um probably the other time it was not so the question was should we implement the login sign up uh, whatever you want pages and the answer is no. no so this i think that is pretty clear right now so we can just leave this one moment for the video I don't know if I see an application with a login page, I don't know the group, um, how well survived the exam. I don't know. Um, next week, I will not be here. Um, so if you write to me on Slack, expect delay. Um, but this is not related strictly to the course. Tuesday class is canceled. We have one hour and a half more than expected in this semester for this class. So we decided to delete this very um, lovely class at this time. So Tuesday class is, is cancelled. We will not recover it, just cancelled. Never happened. Wednesday class will be dedicated one hour and a half with Professor Corno to exercises for the exam, for the written exam. One hour and a half for this. And then we'll also have another one hour and a half for exercises in January, obviously, to give you multiple sample of question. Thursday lab next week will be instead regular, still about uh, supervised work group, uh, um, supervised work group, uh, um, and application uh, your application. And hopefully next week you will receive also the feedback about the milestone number three. Uh, so, uh, I will not be here that week, yeah. Will be the Wednesday class record video recording? Um, this is a good question. Uh, I think so. I think so. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, because since he's Professor Corno that uh, is doing that, I think so. Because I, I don't, he's not, tomorrow we cannot do this because we are opening an application with also maybe let's call it personal data and we are going to to discuss together so it's not really useful to have a video recording of silence 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 some word silence 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 but this should be exercise so i i think so i, I can ask maybe not for tomorrow for tuesday but i can ask um so and then uh, the exercise will be on uh, the website obviously with the answer, with the solution, I, I would also say. Um, then Thursday lab will be regular. I will not be here, so if you um, just not here in Italy, so if you uh, have to write to me on Slack, expect uh, at least six hours of delay because I, I am in New York City. So if you write on Slack, expect some delay. Uh, about M4, other good news today. Uh, in the end. Milestone number four that was expected for last week of the course is delayed. We decided not to have this uh, in the last Thursday of the course in January, but given it that you, will, you don't have any feedback since the course is over, so since you didn't, didn't have any feedback since the course is over, it's now due seven days before the oral exam or the project presentation so that you have all the time to complete your project and all the time to perform the usability evaluation with your complete project. Otherwise, in week 14, you should have to more or less complete the prototype, do the usability evaluation, and then if you still need time, it, the usability evaluation is not, is not totally completed. It's not, not complete, it's not final. So it could be a problem for, for some groups. So, now you have all the time. The oral exam, as I told you last week, will be one time per session. Per, for, so every time there is a written exam will be also an oral exam. So two times in February, one in July and one in September, in a different date with respect to the written test. Uh, but milestone number four included only the, the usability test in the beginning, now since it's seven days before the, the exam date, 
have to also include the source code of your prototype. So this is the final delivery seven days before the presentation, the, the demonstration of your project, whatever it is, seven days before you have to uh, finalize milestone number one to three, if you didn't, upload milestone number four and the source code of your project, not in the repository on GitHub, on the group repository on GitHub, not in the M4 folder, obviously. M4 folder is just for milestone number four. It could be in a dedicated folder outside everything, in the root of the repository, whatever you want, not inside M1, 2, or 3, or 4. Um, and for the usability lab, we will use the last lab in January, week 14, uh, for the preparation of your script of usability testing. So in that hour in the half, you can prepare the script and you can ask for any clarification, question, doubts that you have during the preparation. Since the planning is the most important part of this process that we, we didn't finish, but you see, we have five slides and we just, we still have five slides and we only speak, spoke about planning today and we don't finish. So planning is really the most important and critical part. So if you plan that very well, it's difficult that you make huge mistakes in the execution and in the analysis of, uh, of the data. Hmm. Okay, do you have any question? Have a good night and a good dinner then. And see you tomorrow. <laughs>